Okay, this is part three of three, the big home stretch, predicting evolution in the age of mammals. Remember to think, thunk, thunk, and put on your thinking caps. If you haven't seen part one or two, I suggest you watch them first. So, trend of increased body size, from the Paleocene to the Pleistocene. When would you predict the overall largest body sizes? Remember the early Cenozoic, a little seasonality, lots of forest, lots of trees, lots of water, warm, warm, and wet. In the late Cenozoic, we have greater seasonality, more open space, there's fewer trees, drier and colder. We go from warm temperate to cold temperate. And the Paleocene and Eocene are paratropical and tropical, warm and wet, middle latitudes. So if we look at a correlation of small and large body masses, if we plot percent fauna of genera less than five kilograms, so we have mammals that are small, so it's under 11 pounds. Most of the fauna is small through the Paleocene, Eocene, 60, 80%, all the way down. In the Miocene, it drops down to 50 or so, as you might expect, all right? Most mammals are small. Bats, rodents, they make up most of the mammals, even today. Um, by the way, these data plots I show on correlations with global temperature, these are data updated from my dissertation of 1998. So I have a database of Cenozoic mammals. This is where I get all this data. So this is my data, not stuff I just looked up. And then we can look at more and more large body mammals with cooling temperatures, generally greater than 150 kilograms in red there. You can see there aren't many large mammals in the Paleocene. You get more through the Eocene, kind of levels off a little. Then through the Miocene, you get more and more and more. And through the cold temperate Pleistocene, you get quite a few more. The correlation coefficients between the these two body mass curves, right, they're kind of mirror image. Right? Well, actually, they're pretty good. The correlation is negative 0.89. So that's high mirror image. If you correlate temperature trends with mammals greater than 150 kilograms, Correlation coefficient is minus 0.74. So as body mass increases, temperature goes down, or vice versa. As temperature goes down, body masses go up. For five kilograms in temperature, correlation coefficient is 0.67. I didn't expect it to be better than the large mammal one. There you go. If we just look at average body masses, for these 27 units through the Paleocene all the way to the Pleistocene. All right, you can see average body mass is quite small in the Paleocene. It gets a little bigger as global temperature drops. It shrinks a little, gets really big through the middle and late Miocene, and really big all the way down in the Pleistocene. In fact, the five top heaviest ma average masses in cold temperate mid latitudes, late Miocene to Pleistocene. Right, that's where you find the heaviest average mammals in, a, in the North American um, fauna. Highest average body mass is in the Ice Age, about 290 kilograms. So uh, that's a pretty good size for average. Increasing body mass and decreasing temperature trend correlation coefficient. It's negative 0 0.76. So this was updated in 2015 for North America. That represented at that time 1,443 genera, over 3,800 distribution points across 27 time periods. These time periods represent Milankovitch cycles, and <laughs> that's another talk. So, evolving a larger body size. Why? What are the advantages? Because there's a big cost of getting bigger. You got to eat a lot more food. They're easy to find, and you may have trouble hiding from predators if you're bigger. Right? A lot of things are bad about being big. You're more likely to become extinct, although some people argue it's not true. Eh. So advantages to bigger size. In larger herbivores, though they need absolutely more food, you have a lower metabolic rate the larger you are. Compare the heart rate of a mouse to an elephant. You'll find there's a big difference. So if you're bigger, you can adapt to lower quality vegetation right? as an herbivore. Larger herbivores, there's room for larger digestive tract. That's often a major selective force for larger size. Is adapting to lower quality food, you need to be bigger to hold a larger digestive tract to hold a crappier food. It takes more time to digest lower quality food. 
you get more nutrients, particularly if you have a large fermentation chamber, right? The hindgut of a horse or the foregut of a cow, prosodactyl and artiodactyl. You can have relatively more fat and muscle to survive. Plus, you're more insulated. You have relatively, surface area, relatively less surface area if you're larger, and that conserves heat. So you lose heat less. If you're 200 pounds and it's cold outside, you might be fine. If you're 90 pounds and it's cold outside, you might start shivering, at least for that first 20 minutes. You won't starve to death in a day. Shrew may starve to death in a few hours. Right? The metabolic rates and the heat loss in a shrew are phenomenally high. Human, eh, you can survive quite a few days without eating. Not that I'm recommending it. Being bigger is particularly helpful in colder lean times. Right? You have habitat with a marked dry season and severe winter. Being better, is, being bigger is better. Um, in a high seasonality environment, you have bumper crops of food. And if you're big, you can eat a lot of it. Pack on a lot of fat and build up muscle. And then during the winter, you might have enough energy to survive through it without eating that much because there won't be much to eat in a cold, hard winter. Another advantage of being bigger is you can get food that was previously out of reach or too far to travel to. So if food is low density, being bigger can be good. If males battle for mates, bigger is often better, so more successful reproduction. If you're bigger, you get protection from some predators. Imagine how many predators can eat a mouse, right? A shrew is much smaller than a mouse and can kill a mouse. A wolf can kill a mouse. How many can kill a full-grown elephant? In the modern world, nobody. In the past world, hardly anybody. There were saber tooths that specialized on baby elephants, though. Baby elephants, a little more vulnerable. If a predator, you increase body size to hunt bigger prey. So you have an evolutionary arms race, as they say. Predator follows prey. If the prey is adapting to open habitat and becoming bigger, the predators just follow that, as you might expect. Pleistocene giants. Everyone thinks that Pleistocene is something special. But if you go back 7 million years, it's, you see the same type of ecomorphs. They're just a little bit smaller, but there's still some big ones. So the Pleistocene is the time of giants, but it's not unexpected. And it's not that different from 7 million years ago. Anyway, the Ice Age mammals are often called the megafauna. And its evolution is a microcosm of the Cenozoic mammal evolutionary trends. From the early Pleistocene to late Pleistocene, there was great cooling. The last third of the Ice Age was severe cooling. And you see these bigger and bigger mammals and other trends, just like you see across the Cenozoic from about 50 million years ago all the way to the end of the Ice Age. So let's look at the Pleistocene. They're big abide to handle larger home range, foods at lower density, and to handle great seasonality, pack on a lot of fat and muscle for cold, dry winter. They're big brained to handle living in a more open and seasonal or changing habitat. So the Ice Age megafauna, they're living large. We have the Columbian mammoth, four meters at the shoulder, 9,100 kilograms. That's a big elephant. For an elephant, it's huge. Giant ground sloth, six meters long, 3,600 kilograms. That's a big sloth. Glyptodon, try to flip one of those over. Three meters, 770 kilograms. Oof, mighty fine eating on one of them, I guess. Giant beavers. There are actually two different giant beaver lineages in North America, convergent forms. They live quite a bit differently from the modern beaver, the bark-chewing, dam-building beaver. The giant beavers did something different. That's another talk. Smilodon, the mega carnivore Smilodon, lion sized cat evolved long slender canines, a dirk tooth saber tooth, as opposed to a scimitar tooth saber tooth. He's built to take down bigger prey than expected for its body size. If you see me in a dark alley, you probably wouldn't be too scared. I'm not a terribly intimidating or muscular human. But if you saw I had a seven inch knife in my hand, you might start thinking twice or maybe even running. All right, that's Smilodon. It's got long canine teeth to cut. It can kill much bigger prey than you expect for its body size. Most predators have a range that they can kill in. Smilodon, you never expect to take down, say, um, let's see, oh, maybe an elephant or at least a 
small elephant, a baby, a young elephant, or a rhino, or a giant beaver, a giant ground sloth. What saber-toothed cats do is they have long sabers for cutting. The dirk tooths actually specialize in cutting the front of the neck. They can cut the windpipe, the carotid artery, and the jugular vein. So that incapacitates the animal faint immediately and then bleed out and suffocate in no time. So it's a very effective way to kill. And it evolves again and again and again throughout the Cenozoic and even before that. But that's another talk. Pleistocene giants. The megafauna includes humans, in particular, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. They are megafauna. All right, we're very large humans, especially um, the Neanderthals, much more muscular than we are, highly adapted, at least some of their populations highly adapted for the Ice Age environment, cooler conditions. Other humans, uh, I don't know enough about them. So there might have been other humans that also reflect megafauna trends, just like modern humans and Neanderthals. Much of the megafauna evolution, as I mentioned, took place in the great cooling of the last 800,000 years of the Ice Age. Modern humans, Homo sapiens, are three, 400,000 years old. Neanderthals are a little older than that, maybe five or 600,000 years old. So Pleistocene giants, their adaptations to more seasonal open habitat. 1983, Geis explained all this in a great paper. He stated, if we compare cold temperate mammals to their more ancestral tropical relatives, we see larger body sizes, bigger brains, greater runners or cursors, and in herbivores, greater hypsidony. In the early Cenozoic, what was the dominant climate? Go back to parts one and two. What do the mammals look like? Why have we considered tropical mammals primitive or more properly, we should say ancestral types, more like our ancestors. The tapir is more like an ancestral mammal than the, ho the modern horse. All right, Eohippus <laughs> is the ancestral horse. So he showed a picture of the red deer radiation, the, t the small temperate adapted red deers all the way to the large subarctic. And you see the same trend. You see ice age giants arose colonizing increasingly seasonal habitat, higher latitudes or altitudes going up a mountainside, right? Where it gets colder and drier. They're characterized by ornate social organs, in this case, big antlers, right? Take a look at the subarctic ant um, antlers of the red deer. Large bodies and ecological plasticity, plasticity, there we go. Meaning a greater range of behavior. And that literally means a bigger, more complex brain. New world radiation of deers, tropic to the Arctic or Alpine. He also described highly seasonal environments have extreme food productivity pulses that select for extremes in body forms. So the tropical zone where it's warm and equable, there's not much difference between summer and winter. You have pretty much a good food supply year round. It's almost the same. There might be a dry season, so maybe food's a little harder, but it's nothing compared to what the moose and the elk and the caribou get in the Arctic or subarctic. Surviving cold, deep snow. Some of these are living in the mountains or where it snows a lot. It's helpful to have a larger body, longer limbs, and more pre-winter fat. That's how you get through the winter. You have the goat antelope radiation, part of the bovine radiation, old world bear radiation. You see the same pattern of tropical to Arctic to subarctic forms. They get larger, bigger, more complex brains. They can really pack on fat. So why evolve a smarter brain? It's a very high cost. You need more dietary protein and fat to grow a bigger brain. There's, the brain's almost 50% lipids, right? A lot of fat, a lot of neurons to insulate, a lot of lipids. Its oxygen and sugar costs are enormous. Well, let's look at humans. We're very, very fat headed. Our brains are enormous. People don't realize how large our heads are. Big, big fat headed. So in humans, adult humans, the brain's about 2% of the body mass. But it uses about 20% of the body's oxygen, 20%, right? And at rest, it burns 60% of the glucose circulating through your body, 60%. Greedy little organ, isn't it? Well, it does rule everything, so there you go. If we look at Eohippus brain cast and Equus brain, 
So the great thing about mammals is they have large brains and they press upon the brains of the, the bones of the cranium. So you actually get a good impression of the surface of the brain in mammals. <laughs> in something like T-Rex or any reptile, um, the brain cavity is like half liquid or more. So you really don't get a decent impression like you do in a mammal. So if you look at an Eohippus brain cast, right? And the equus brain, you can see not just a change in size, but in complexity. The Eohippus brain cast is very smooth, not a lot of ridges and folds, right? Equus, lots of ridges and folds, right? It's not just bigger due to larger body size, but the cortex is relatively larger. There are more neurons and folds in the outer brain equals more connections, and that is more gray matter processing power. So they are more smarter, <laughs> more smarter, good English. Why? Well, let's compare a closed habitat situation to an open habitat situation, right? Why do you need more neurons and more interconnections in open habitat? So look at the two prey predator scenarios, a deer and a cat in a forest versus a caribou and wolves in the tundra, right? You're a deer walking through the woods, maybe stoop down to a pond, get a drink, and boom, a cat attacks you. Interaction lasts seconds, ambush predator. It jumps, you react, you run, you might get away, that's it, right? Not a lot of decisions to be made. You hear or see or feel the cat upon you and you try to escape. What if you're in open habitat? You're a caribou sitting in the tundra. Oh, two, three kilometers away, you see a pack of wolves. You go, uh-oh, what do I do? Oh, they're headed this way. All right, do I run now? Well, I'm just, I need to eat. I have to eat a lot per day to pack on enough to survive the winter. In the winter, I go and get a little food, scraping away snow, eating some moss, you know, not that nutritious. So I got to eat all I can. So what am I going to do? All right, a few minutes later, oh, they're, they're closer now. What should I do? Should I move over there? Should I pull my head up and watch them more until they get really close? Do I listen to my herd and see what they do? If they start running, should I follow them? Should I run off to the left and they go to the right? I think the left is a better choice. I can cross the stream and then maybe lose them. I don't know. So what happens in open habitat is interactions between prey or predator are much, much longer. It could be minutes or longer, right? In a closed habitat, it may be a second or maybe a minute or two, right? In an open habitat, it's very advantageous to think a lot more, imagine the future. What could happen as prey and predator get closer and closer? What are the possible scenarios and choices so one can figure out how to survive, right? The wolf pack is gonna have to not just work together, which takes a lot of smarts, they're gonna have to figure out how to attack the herd, all right? How can they isolate one or two? All right, which one do they pick? When should they start running? If he's getting away, should they stop? Should some of the wolves go ahead and cut off the ones that are running away? A lot of wolves, when they chase a moose, they'll plan out for miles and plan ahead and chase. The wolves will chase the moose into some moose waiting for them. Those wolves will chase the moose into the others and they'll just wear it out and then it'll be so tired he can't fight back. And they might not get killed when they try to kill the moose. <laughs> Don't ever get kicked by a moose. That's my doctor advice for the day. So brain evolution. Sound sights and smells can almost always be sensed at a much greater distance and over a longer time period in open habitat compared to a closed. So you need more imagination right, to make decisions. And then there are many more decisions to make over minutes and minutes and minutes. Also, living in a more open habitat means greater seasonality. An animal has to deal with up to four different environments in a seasonal habitat without leaving home. That requires more to know for survival. Right? Life is simply more complex with greater seasonality. Look at that fox. Snow all the way to summer grass. So how fat-headed are humans? Right? I love this picture. If you scale human up to gorilla size, the head is three times bigger. That's how enormous our brains are. Girls are smart. Coco learned to sign. She created new sentences, right? Smart mammal. Humans still put them to shame. Mammals specialize in learning. Humans are 
take this to the most extreme. Our behavior is extremely plastic. We're able to do this because of our phenomenal processing power and memory. What's really interesting is that we don't just feed in one or few microhabitats like other animals. I always find this fascinating. We exploit everything. We eat anything and everything. We go under the ground. We go into the trees. We go under the water. Roots, seeds, fruits, leaves, insects, clams, fish, reptiles, mammals. You name it. We're going to eat it. Right? So, the major mammalian evolutionary trends through the age of mammals and birds, or the Cenozoic if you prefer, increased body size, increased brain size and complexity, increased hypsidony, increased coarseality, really longer limbs for an efficient gait for traveling far to get enough food, right? and increased running speed. If you burn too many calories getting food, you don't get enough calories, you starve to death. So in an open habitat, if you're fairly big, Right. Small to medium to large mammal, and long limbs really help. This all can be explained by adaptation to more open and seasonal habitat. It's produced by a colder and drier climate. This is the major environmental trend of the Earth for the past 50 million years or so. So this is why we see this trend, or at least maybe I've convinced you of it. You come once again to how predictable is life. Simple logic might get you far in science. It might not. In real life, uh, I haven't had such good luck. So that's the end of part three of three, predicting evolution, the age of mammals and birds. And there's our famous Barbie, Barbara Ophelis. Help feed her. She's all no skin and bones. And I hope you enjoyed my fossil fun. Meow. And this is the obligatory post credit scene. Dirk tooth in North America. This independent evolution of Dirk saber tooth ecomorphs among three different times of feliform carnivores. 29 million years ago or so, you had Hoplophonius, an Imaravid, a cat-like animal, but not a true cat. Then you had Barbrophilus, related to Nimravids, but still a different family. It also evolved Dirk Tooth about 7 million years ago in North America. And then you have the one you're probably most familiar with during the Ice Age. So when extinct 11, 12, 11 or 12,000 years ago was the Felid Smilodon. This pattern of convergence is actually much more of the story. But once again, that's a different talk. Thank you.